it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly Brooker, who's come to us from University of Newcastle. Um, and Kaylee is somebody who loves typography, I believe, which is a, a very special thing. Kaylee Brooker is a designer and uh, an artist whose work explores visuality, mark making, materiality, typography, and abstraction. Operating between art and design, her broader practice takes an interdisciplinary approach in bridging the analog and the digital spheres, incorporating studio art, studio art traditional and digital print media, typography, design, image making, and artist books. She has a professional background in commercial design, creative pedagogy, and cultural and creative industries. So she's worked in an ARI, um, she's been around, she's taught, she's worked in an ARI, and here she is today. Kaylee, please, welcome. Guys, you'll have to bear with me. I've learnt my first digital analogue lesson today that I should have actually printed my slides out because, uh, yeah, we don't have presenter views. So bear with me. I've got to press two buttons at once instead of just one. Um, I hope for you never to have to go after Ian Burns in a presentation. <laughs> but as Barbara said, it's a definite change in time um, and I'm feeling a little regional right now. But um, I really enjoyed that and I'm, I've put a fan and a ANSTI surgical glove on my shopping list anyway for the way home. So guys, I um, firstly, hello, thank you for having me. I'm actually really honoured to be representing Newcastle. I believe there's a small Newcastle contingent, so hi. Um, thank you to the DDCA, of course, Barbara Bolt and her lovely team, as well as the VCA and the MCM for having us and thank you to you guys for attending. Um, also, I think it's really important to thank the creative practitioners who've actually made a doctorate, a creative doctorate possible, who fought really hard for creative research to be acknowledged within the academy. I think that's really important. Uh, that's why we're here. And it's been a wonderful event so far, so I hope not to spoil it now. But <laughs> we'll see how we go. Um, so once again, hello. My name's Kaylee. I lecture in visual communication at the University of Newcastle. So even though my PhD, sorry, I'm rattling, I'll take these off. Um, even though my PhD was in fine arts, uh, I've been lucky enough to be employed as a full-time academic, albeit not in quite the same um, department or faculty that I was actually, uh, did my PhD in. And I really related to what Paul, our um, keynote speaker said when he was talking about the agendas of STEM research. So now I'm actually in a, a science, um, faculty, so things are a little bit different over there and it's really nice to come back to creative arts and reflect on my PhD. So uh, this is actually the first time I've had the opportunity to reflect on my PhD uh, because I pretty much uh, installed my examination exhibition one weekend and then on the Monday I had to start my new full-time job in academia, which I'm very grateful for but I'm actually really grateful for this opportunity to reflect because I really haven't done that. So just indulge me a little. Um, so this image sort of contextualizes my aesthetic. It contextualizes where I come from as a creative practitioner. Um, my fine arts training was actually at the National Art School, a very atelier model in the 1990s. Um, and my PhD was undertaken after quite a long period of commercial design work, um, but it did build on an honours uh, degree uh, in painting, printmaking, drawing at Newcastle University. So my work definitely speaks to my visual tendencies, and as much as I admire and, and am more able to achieve it in design, a, a sort of austere, minimal and monochromatic aesthetic, I think you can see by this image that I've included, it's just not me. So, as Peter Waller mentioned beautifully yesterday when he spoke about uh, Zen, uh, suffering begins when we fight the way that things are. So I say this and show you this image partly as a confession and a declaration, so you know where I'm coming from visually. So I'm, I'm not going to read this to you guys, you can read this online, but I show you this abstract, which I'm sure like everybody's PhD abstracts were composed and recomposed many, many times. Uh, this is the textual contextualization and the ex explication of my research. I've actually included it as a contrast to the rather 
chaotic mark making image previously, not to reinforce or set up any kind of word image opposition, but as a gentle visual reminder, as Margaret Merrilee so uh, eloquently put yesterday, of the almost bilingual nature of many of our creative research requirements that need to speak in two languages, if not more. Um, so this is probably a more appropriate and accessible level of detail for our short presentations. Um, I'm sure everyone's had trouble containing and trying to convey their research in this period of time. I've never presented my research um, in this sort of short time frame. So you can see from this list of keywords some of the particular paradigms from both art and design that were employed in the research. So I would say really importantly that my research exists, or existed then and still exists within that art and design nexus. Um, sorry, you'll have to excuse the changes of tense. So some aspects of the research I sort of still refer to in the now and others are probably spoken of in a past tense. So obviously there's not enough time today to examine with any real quality many of the areas touched on by the research, but I, um, I hope to focus on the ways that practice is foregrounded. Okay, the two button thing's working okay. Um, so as the title of the research suggests, um, what did I actually make? So what did it consist of? In one sense, I'm a very traditional sort of studio artist, so my background is printmaking, even in design, my background is print media. It was paintings, drawings, design artifacts, artist books, installation pieces, dimensional works, digital works, and visual essays. So it was quite busy, unsurprisingly. But the mark itself was terribly important uh, in my research. So the mark, appeared in many guises throughout the thesis, um, as traditional painting, drawing, all of these things, but also as typography, text, diagrams, digital tools. The mark operated as the ever-present instrument of investigation, of process, of material inquiry, expression, expression and creation. The mark is critical for my practice across the many translations and negotiations presented in the research. This is a little bit of what the mark looked like materialised in the exhibition. It's a few little snapshots. Um, obviously, as Ian uh, suggested, this is not an exhibition, this is not a gallery, this is not the usual context for presenting visual work. So I'm just hoping to give you a little insight into what my particular practice-led research looked like. So on the left, you'll see a very large artist book laid out. Um, it consisted of prints, drawing, uh, monotypes, and was stitched together, but it was very weighty, so it didn't stand up in the traditional sense it had to be laid out. Um, up the top, you'll see some of the printmaking, which uh, connected very much to the Deleuzian thought that I was looking at through the exhibition. There's some studio ob objects. The importance of the studio was really foregrounded in my research. Um, I'd like to think it wasn't the only reason that I did a PhD to hold on to my honours studio, but I think it actually had some part in it, um, if I'm completely <laughs> honest. But the work itself certainly extended existing paths of material practice, but it was definitely inspired by something quite new for me. So uh, what was it that actually instigated the research? Like I said, other than the wish to keep my studio, it was actually a moment of awareness prompted by a slip or a sense of slippage between art and design that prompted my research. So um, this quote here I'll read out to you as this is my handwriting typeface so it may not be as legible as you would like. I can no longer remember what the error was. I only remember the momentary urge to undo something in the painting and then the slightest twitch of thumb and forefinger in a familiar and almost imperceptible gesture towards a non-existent keyboard. So basically I tried to command Z a painting. Um, I've actually seen my students do this since and I've spoken to other artists who are quite digitally literate and it's not, a, not uncommon but it really brought something home for me. So it was with slight but very real embarrassment that I acknowledged what I'd just done. By Invoking Command Z in the physical world of my studio beyond the computer screen, 
I'd committed a very curious transgression and I had slipped momentarily and in doing so had unknowingly crossed a haptic divide. So this tiny gesture revealed to me that my conscious separation of the experiential and creative paradigms of art and design was not as real and certainly not as complete as I had imagined. Um, Barbara was very kind to mention my interest in typography and the, the typeface that you see on screen was actually developed as an adjunct or as part of my creative research to uh, appear throughout the PhD, the written thesis component, to demonstrate or to, to better explicate that sense of personal voice. So in terms of how we speak in an academic sense and how we speak from personal experience in the studio, this was the personal voice articulated through typographic means. Um, it's connected to the writing of Joanna Drucker and her work on graphesis and the non-neutrality uh, non of the page, um, which is something that's definitely part of the PhD, but not what I wanted to talk about today. The rest, just to give credit to my colleagues, the rest of the um, slides are actually set in Halverson Pro, which is a typeface designed by one of my lovely colleagues, Wayne Compton. And the typefaces themselves were included as appendices uh, in the paper. So, um, moving on. So, this is actually a, a specimen sheet for the typeface. It's still a beta typeface. Um, it's not necessarily meant to be perfectly legible, but it's meant to be a change of pace for the reader to pay attention in a slightly different way to what's being said. Um, and it's definitely just based on my handwriting and comes in two weights. So, dead Frenchman. Um, what texts have informed the research? So, I remember really vividly a piece of PhD guidance, which I'm quite sure was meant to reassure me. Uh, and it was that there was no need to resort to reading 20th century philosophy or the work of dead Frenchmen or the work of dead Germans for that matter. Um, especially anything remotely re resembling post-structuralism or post-post-structuralism or phenomenology. But to be honest, um, and I don't have some sort of oppositional disorder, but that just made me want to do it. So I found myself working primarily with texts by Deleuze and Deleuze in collaboration with Guattari to contextualise my research. So that was the dialogue uh, that was taken, bet uh, undertaken between me, my practice and some dead French men's thoughts. So um, I was touched to think of Deleuze's own doctoral thesis, Difference and Repetition. Um, it held particular significance for my work in printmaking, um, print media and print production. It made me aware of minds much greater than my own who had experienced, or should we say survived, their own version of the PhD. Um, I also felt through this um, a connection to tradition, I felt encouraged by the thought that Deleuze had considered the production and conception of art so highly, which is why his thinking appealed to me. Uh, this made me warm to his um, often deliberately obscure or seemingly del deliberately <laughs> obscure writing, often to the point of defensiveness. So I often defend him in public um, or bars or wherever. But I appreciated that his insistence uh, was on philosophy as a tool for use, a practical working philosophy in the world. I, I really like that. So in this way, some of Deleuze's key philosophical concepts emerge with particular relevance to my research as ideas open to artistic and personal interpretation and application uh, in accordance with aspects of their philosophy that resonate with the creative thesis, a particularly deleuze guitarian and Deleuzean ontology and interpretation is employed but definitely from a practitioner perspective. Um, in recognition of that significant force of art in absorbing, generating, speculating, transforming and materialising ideas. So this occurred through the generative, conceptual and creative encounter of mark making and the application of a rhizomatic model to creative research, which was kind of the final overarching, um, overarching framework of the research. Move this laptop slide. Okay, so 
Um, even the images of dead Frenchmen crept into the practice. So these letterpress prints refer to means of reproduction and typography um, revived, but certainly not commercially viable in the same way that they were. They refer to the history and tradition of design and reproduction. Um, and so behind those are some transfers of Deluden Guitari, I think, sitting at a bar for a drink. Um, so it, the, the kind of identification with something that you've read a lot kind of crept into the work itself. So the preoccupations of the research for the sake of the presentation, uh, I'll give you the short version. So beyond the keywords mentioned earlier, what have been the themes of the research? So primarily the research engaged with, like I said, that fundamental unit of mark making as both subject and methodology with which to explore the abstract, the symbolic, the gestural and the linear in light of those personal paradigms of digital design and creativity. Uh, the research asks what the negotiation of these paradigms might bring to my practice and how that art design nexus might materialise in a practical practice, studio practice context. So in writing about the mark and its personal manifestations in the digital age, I was also focused on using a toolbox, um, which is a Foucault uh, analogy of specific inherited concepts and metaphors through which the process of mark making could be examined, positioned and experienced. So these significant conceptual and theoretical motifs were also vital in shaping the research for my exhibition and thesis, Lost in Translation, specifically binaries, difference and repetition, the visual and diagrammatic uh, thinking, graphesis, which is the Joanna Drucker concept, uh, the rhizome and obviously the theme of translation itself. So the binaries, uh, what, how did these materialise in the research? What I wanted to talk about today is specifically the practical, experiential, exhibition-based experiments uh, and that dialogue between theory and practice that occurred not necessarily at the end of the exhibition for that final examination, but all the smaller exhibitions along the way. So for the purposes of uh, talking about this dialogue regarding practice, this is what I wanted to uh, talk about, linking those practical <coughs> and theoretical framing components of the PhD quite explicitly. So these identified binaries came from the, what I was reading around at the time. They concerned binary oppositions which reflected the perceived art and design binary that inspired the research. And the research continued along these binary lines for quite a time before the rhizome took its place and took precedence as a concept uh, within which these binaries could be incorporated. Um, so I won't talk about them all. I've just got three examples of these binary experiments. So there is, <coughs> to my mind, an undeniable trope in art discourse, theory, criticism and making to gather thinking from other disciplines and apply it, whether loosely or explicitly, to, uh, to art, to our practice, whether it's old, new, outmoded, or seemingly distinct from practice. There were many experimental excursions through exhibitions in my research um, as part of this list, which uses a theoretical toolkit rather than that design toolkit, but they continue the theme of borrowing, gathering, and transformation. So, as the primary context for my creative research are the fields of art and design, I think it's important to note that I wrote my PhD wholly as an artist and designer, not as an art historian, art critic, anthropologist, or semiotician, even though I looked at all these things. Uh, the follow ex following excursions are creative research explorations, and they divert ideas from these other disciplines and areas of discourse towards personal creative intent. So, <laughs> Part of that process of looking back and reflecting on my PhD is I feel a little cringe about how excruciatingly personal it was compared to some um, and that little bit of anxiety around its relevance for others. But I think uh, that's what art can bring is those I idiosyncratic readings and I think they're really important in terms of creating knowledge and interpreting. So these are offered as demonstrations in ways in which inherited ideas were tested and researched through practice and how they were applied to multiple binaries. So uh, this 
anthropological binary was a cognitive technical binary, so looking at the heritage of the mark and the tools of making. So um, it looked at the suggestion that it wasn't just a cognitive, uh, it was like a cognitive versus a tool-based uh, evolutionary pattern. So I was looking at how we, how we use tools, the digital as a, simply an extension of existing tools, um, and one of the most important manifestations of uh, our humanness in terms of making images. Um, so I made, up in the top right, you can see these handmade tools. They were things like hair and gum and glue and sticks um, to make these analog marks, which you see underneath. So these analog marks were then scanned in, they were vectorized um, and turned into digital brushes in uh, a sort of translative mediation of the mark making that was made in a really traditional kind of analog way. So that, uh, that binary started off the digital translation of those brushes. Um, so this here is a sample sheet of the brushes which were included as an appendice in the PhD. So these can be used, um, it doesn't matter about resolution because they're a vector file, they could actually be blown up to the size of a billboard and they would retain their same sense uh, so there's digital advantages, despite um, I waxed rhapsodical about the materiality and the touch and the tactile and the haptic in my PhD, but I came to realise that um, the digital also has a particular materiality and a particular resonance and lots of particular advantages. So despite all of us cursing PowerPoint and technology today, sometimes it does, it does do wonderful things and enables creativity of a different kind. So the other binary I looked at was that material immaterial binary. So digital gestures and the simulated dematerialized mark. So this was an installation um, which basically consisted of a scanner hooked up to a projector. So I asked people to make marks, draw pictures, write whatever they want on these little pieces of paper. Um, and then they were asked to feed them into the scanner. They were asked not to do anything wonderful because they might lose it. But once it went into the scanner, it was promptly shredded and all the little red bits of paper you see are falling on the ground. That's what happened to the bits of paper. But at the same time, it was digitally projected. Um, so what was most interesting about this was listening to people's responses when they saw their work shredded. So I, I sort of hung out in the gallery space anonymously and just listened to people. In hindsight, I wish I'd recorded some of their, um, some of their responses. But um, anyway, what they, what they were asked to do, the important detail of this experiment was the scanner was connected to the shredder. Um, so images were promptly destroyed as they were displayed. So they no longer existed in the same material form as they had a moment ago. So although I'd warned participants not to scan anything they weren't prepared to lose, some scrambled to save their drawings from the scanner, only to be offered a handful of red cardboard strips in return. So, um, and once again, you've got to open it up to chance, as Ian said, so it broke so many times, I can't even tell you. But it was, you know, fun to fix, and when it half worked, it was kind of interesting too. So the images that many people drew were mostly unremarkable. There were scribbles, words, faces, the ubiquitous genitalia. Um, some watched the others perform the process. People were quite afraid of participating, so they wanted other people to do it first before they had a go. Some people drew over several sheets of paper, so they wanted to see their images in sequence on the wall, so they'd kind of gamed the system by watching other people do it. It was fascinating, like I said, those conversations and the mild anxiety among participants that something had indeed been lost in this process of tr translating their image from one medium to another. So in seeing their small creative work shredded, they had lost what they felt was some sense of the original, something perceivable and tactile, something that the digitization and the projected image of their work did not entirely satisfy. So something was lost and the translation had failed. So this was where the title of the exhibition came from, that sense that 
uh, the space in the space between the analog and the digital or between art and design that something could be perhaps ooh, lost um, I don't know what that is <laughs> oh dear this is the last um, this is the last binary I'll uh, talk about, but it was a nature-nurture binary. So it was about developmental mark-making and learning visuality. So the fact that most of us are, all of us I would say, are extremely visual as children and it's almost like a developmental choice at a certain point in time not to be visual in the same way, so not to draw. Um, and that fascinated me. So on the left is a, an artwork entitled Sweet pre-schematic and on the right hand side is actually one of my drawings from when I was about three or four or five which thankfully my mother is as big a hoarder as me so she had every drawing I'd ever done which was nice. Um, the important thing about this binary examined through, um, examined through exhibition and practice was that it brought another dimension to my work which was really important which was scent. Um, so I have my handsome assistant, Matt, who is um, going to hand round, and please excuse the used coffee cups, just some little bits of cardboard with the scent, the scent of the exhibition, essentially the scent of my PhD. So it's, uh, yeah, I had a sort of discipline envy watching some of the performative presentations that have been so successful. Um, and I felt a little bit at a loss just serving up pictures of pictures as a substitute for the material and experiential dimensions of visual practice, which I acknowledge are really important. So the condition of presenting this material work beyond the original context um, and the symposium's rules of engagement, it was an important and relevant challenge touched on by many of our speakers. So this material dialogue um, was framed by offering our varied presentations in a different and surely somewhat altered state as to what we would present them for our PhD. So my response to this challenge is to offer you a fragment of the sensorial experience of my research. So this sense sample, even without the visual context of the exhibition, is as close to an experience of any given aspect of the work that I can offer you today. So the little container of scented samples, as it's passed around, there's plenty, take one or just sniff it if you would like. But the important thing is that the scent is one of very subjective and idiosyncratic association. It's the ability of scent in conjuring up memory and moment, uh, just ask Proust, is well documented. And for me, this scent evokes limestone, caves, cool caverns and the wet smells of underground systems. It was sprayed on the pages of the large scale artist book um, and it conjures up the really important uh, cave imagery for me. So uh, I'll move on to that quickly because I realise that I'm running out of time. So back to the visual. Why this scent? It conjures up the caves. So with all their mythology, their cultural, literary and personal symbolism, the cave stemmed from that combination of personal history, memory, affinity and association. So I couldn't tell you how many caves I've drawn throughout this research. It wasn't so much a visual preoccupation as an obsession. Um, it was synonymous with containment, contemplation, the unconscious mind, fertility. There's so much uh, mythology and symbolism associated with the cave. So manifesting through several years of prints, drawings and paintings, the work also refers to Plato's cave. It's examined through printmaking and Deleuze's difference and repetition, as well as those personal associations. This is just some of the prints spread out for work in the studio. After working with the cave imagery across several exhibitions, I came to realise that there was significant alter symbolism to the cave, and that was the mound. Um, so a corresponding and corollary symbol to the cave. So the mound was the outer to the cave's inner. It was a protrusion to its intrusion. It contrasted the invisible with the visible and provided an exteriority to complement the symbolic interiority of the cave. So. This is in part the principle behind the visual contronym, which is one of the outcomes of my research. Um, that's a lovely Virginia Woolf quote about staring at things too long um, and how they shift. But I really just want to get to the visual contronym. So more about caves. Um, basically
basically the visual contronym is a unique term I've given to a particular category and materialization of shapes, images and symbols that have emerged through my encounter with Velusian difference and repetition. So they've provided a vital framework for exploring the material concerns of my research and are most evident in those caves and mound shapes. So those dual shapes that can represent two things. So there's lots of other sources and references for the visual com uh, for the visual contronym. So these reversible, bistable, multi-sable uh, perception diagrams, the Gestalt principles in operation, which some of our speakers have spoken about. Um, the visual contronym is an artistic suggestion of the connotations or denotations of shape. So it works, um, it works in a similar way to a, a literary contronym. So uh, these two shapes, for example, one's a print, one's a digital file, it could be an image of a mound or it could be an image of a cave. So it's that interiority, exteriority, that binary combined in one sort of image. So there were lots of others. There were towers, tunnels, um, locks, bags, doorways, barriers, stalagmites, stalactites to continue the cave uh, sort of feel. But importantly, the cave was definitely the main visual contronym or dual image that was present um, in the work. So really quickly, the rhizome um, embodied this move from binary opposition towards rhizomatic inclusion. So those binaries that had been examined um, in those other exhibitions on the way, through my reading, through my practice, I came to understand um, the sort of chaotic approach, the sense of the artist and designer as collector and bricolage uh, as a term. So uh, the rhizome, which came from uh, the Deleuze Qatarian text, A Thousand Plateaus, was kind of a structural non-structure for creative research. So this was another part of the key knowledges revealed um, or applied in my work. So a practical means of navigating and mapping the multiplicities and potentialities revealed through creative research. So moving beyond and between and through binaries towards this rhizome proved a fundamental shift in visualising a shape for creative research. It opened up new spaces of discourse and connectivity. It's a navigation system that belongs to something that's not linear, it's not hierarchical. So when your supervisor says, give me chapters one, two, three, four, five in order, that doesn't happen. So um, it kind of mirrored the actual process of writing the PhD for me. Um, and the works for exhibition and the accompanying text actually connected these material structures and examples of applied uh, rhizomatic models of creativity. So part of the awareness of the rhizome was actually through tools like mind mapping, so some of those paradigms from design, such as those there. Also, they merged together in the cave, the mound. This is, these are made with the digital marks, but also a symbolised rhizome shape took part in these images as well. So, postscript to the research, <coughs> summing it up, um, what has it been, what's been revealed, and what have we learnt? I think most importantly this quote uh, by M Maria Wisława Anna Simborska, who's a Polish uh, Nobel laureate and uh, Polish poet, um, any knowledge uh, that doesn't lead to new questions quickly dies out. It fails to maintain the temperature required for sustaining life. Um, I think that's really important. I think that's where whatever we've done for our research, that's where it takes us. So most significantly, the PhD has been important. It helped me to find a research voice within the many guises of creative research. So the many guises that have been explored, discussed and exemplified here today. Um, it's also determined for me that the encounters of the practice-led process are open-ended acts of material and conceptual translation. So, sorry to rush, guys, but I might leave you with that uh, sentiment. And thank you again for your time. Cheers.